Amen. I could do a little more of that. Amen. That was all right. All right. First John chapter 3 tonight as we continue where we left off this morning in Sunday school. And uh, like I said, we uh, should have our new uh, material in uh, this coming Sunday. So I hope you'll plan to be with us in uh, Sunday school as we get started on that. But we're in 1 John chapter 3. And uh, I think we left off here in about verse number 16 or so. Um, But let's look at verse 16. As I said this morning, what a great statement that John makes there. Somebody says, oh, God is love. And that's what John says in his, in his writings. And somebody looks around at the world today and they say, well, if God is love, why is all this happening in the world? And, uh, you know, we talked about this before, about the questions. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? We said, well, number one, there are no good people. Amen. And number two, the real question is, why does God let good things happen to bad people? And the answer to that is Calvary. Amen. But we look around, we say, oh, is God really love? Well, look at all these things that's happened. Where's the proof of his love? Well, John answers that question. Verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God. You want to know how I know God loves me? Because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So what a statement. There's how you see the love of God. Now, of course, we know the love of God is evident in many other areas. The very fact that we are born with a conscience that tells us there is a right or wrong. That's not enough to be saved by, but it's enough to point us in the direction that, hey, there is a right or wrong. And the fact that he has given us creation, which points us towards a creator, Again, that's not enough to be saved by, but it continues to point us in that direction. And he has given us scripture, his word, to show us how we can be saved. And then we have Christ who came and died for us. And we have the church, which is set up to give the gospel to the world. And we have Christians who are to show the love of Christ to others. Uh, boy, and, and just every single day, the things that God does for us, both the, the just and the unjust, how he shows mercy every day. Uh, we can see the love of God everywhere. And again, if we get that understanding that we don't deserve anything but hell, and then look at all that he has done for us, then we recognize, boy, he does love us. But the ultimate uh, description, the ultimate evidence of his love is that Christ died for us. And that's what John says. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Here's how we know there's no question about it that he died for us. But God commendeth his love toward us. That word commendeth means demonstrated or showed. He proved to us his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say, okay, if you can clean your act up, I'll die for you. I'll die on the cross and it's available for all those that get their act together and they they start doing right. Then my blood's here to help it. No, no, when we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's how he showed his love to us. John 15, verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And John says that the way we are able to see the love of God for us is that Christ died for us. And the greatest mystery of the universe, that the creator would become one of his own creation and die so that they could be reconciled to him. That's the great mystery, why he would do that. We get so full of pride That we get to thinking, well, of course God would do that for us. How dare you, God, be sending us to hell anyway? You ought to fix that. And he said, no, you deserve that. That he would reach down and make that way for us. It's, It's a great mystery. We can't understand how he could love us so, but his sacrifice proves that he does. And John then uses the example of Christ's love and sacrifice for us to give us a way to demonstrate our love to others. Did you see that? He says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is the ultimate expression of love because our lives are the ultimate gift that we have to give. Somebody comes along and says, Hey, I I need something. You say, Well, I got that. I can can help with that. And then they say, Well, I need this. Well, I don't know. That's a little more valuable. I guess I can give you that. But if you're willing to lay your life down for someone, that's the most valuable thing you have that you can give to someone else. 
And so if you're willing to do that, it proves that you have unmatched love for that person. You know, God could have just given us the prophets. He could have just given us uh, the uh, writings in the Word of God, the angels, whatever. But no, he gave us the greatest gift he could possibly give in that of his son, dying for us. And that is proof positive of his love for us. And he says that because of that, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We talked a little bit about that this morning in Sunday school and said, you know, probably we'll not have an opportunity to do that. But if we are willing to do that, then anything else we do should not be any problem. If our brother or sister needs something, we ought to be able to do that. But we should be willing to lay down our life. And you say, well, that sounds kind of extreme to be expected to die for a brother in Christ. But how does Paul describe Christ's sacrifice for the church? Ephesians 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself for the church. We ought to be willing to do the same thing. Amen? And so that was where we left off this morning. What an amazing evidence of the love of God. And then what an amazing uh, inducement on us to show that love to someone else. And when we do that, somebody said, well, why would you do that for that person? How would you sacrifice like that for that person? Especially, you know, we think, well, you know, my friends, I'll do something. For, but you know what they did to me? I'm not going to do anything for them. But when you show love to someone who has hurt you, someone who has done something to you, people say, how can you do that? And you say, you know what, I can't in my own strength. But Jesus Christ died for me when I was a sinner. And when he knew that I would reject his offer of salvation time and again, and when I would finally accept it, I would rebel and I would fail over and over, he knew all of that, and yet he died for me anyway. And because he did that, I can do that for someone else. And so when we do that, they say, hey, I want to know about this. This is a different kind of love. We don't see this in the world. And that's the kind of love we have. So we'll pick up in verse 17 tonight. Father, again, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for this great demonstration of love that we have, that Christ would lay his life down for us. And then, Lord, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren as well. And, Lord, though we may not ever have that opportunity to do that, it should be shown in how we uh, react with one another and how we love one another. And uh, as we said this morning, when we do so, it shows the world that we're your disciples. And we certainly want the world to see that. So help us as we continue to study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse number 17, uh, how are we going to do that? Notice he says, end of verse 16, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, I may not get a chance to jump in front of a bullet for my brother and sister in Christ, but there's a lot of other things I can do. And so he goes on in verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Do you see how the context follows right along with this? Boy, God's given us a great demonstration of love in that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Yeah, boy, I'd do that. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I would die for them. All right, well, brother, listen, I'm a little short this week on my rent. Could you help me? Well, look, I, I'm sorry. I can't do that. You know, I got other things to do. I can't. Oh, you're going to lay down your life for somebody, but you can't help them out with a little something? Drive down the road. There they are on the side of the road changing a tire. I ain't got time. I'm sorry, brother. I'll pray for you. He says, hey, you say you're willing to die for your brother, but you won't do a little something. You've got this world's goods, and you're not, you shut up your bowels of compassion. What does he say? How dwelleth the love of God in him? <laughs> Remember, John talks a lot about love. He knew what love was all about because he loved the Lord, and the Lord loved him. And then he'd seen how the Lord had accepted him back after the resurrection, even though he had abandoned him in the garden as well. I've always, you know, in John 21, we won't look at it tonight, but that's that famous passage where the Lord is uh, walking along the seashore with Peter, and he's telling him, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. You remember that? And he gets to the end of that, and, he, and Peter says, and Lord, what shall this man do? He was talking about John. Of course, John doesn't identify himself, but we find out that's John there. And, of course, the Lord says, hey, if I will that he... You know, live till I return. What's that to you? Just do what I've told you to do. And he says, you know, it went around that I wasn't going to die. That's not what he said or whatever. But just get that idea. In my mind, I see the Lord and Peter walking along the seashore, but look who's tagging along behind them. <laughs> John always wanted to be close to the Lord. 
He was always right there with them. I think he's probably giving them some distance, you know, but he wanted to be close to them. He wanted to hear, what's he saying? <laughs> he loved the Lord. The Lord loved him. He knew all about love. And so he said, hey, if you're going to show the love of God to other people, if you have this world's good and you see your brother have need and shut up his, your bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And this is why we end up in a situation where government steps in and says, hey, we'll take care of everything. Because family has not taken care of family, and church has not taken care of their people. We haven't done what we ought to do. And we ought to look around and say, and, you know, in the beginning of the church, at the very beginning of the church age, we remember they were all, they had all things common. They brought everything together. Now, God never told them to do that. That's just something they wanted to do. And, of course, we saw before long human nature took over, and, and they said, well, I want everybody to think I'm doing as much as he is. And they start lying, and it all breaks down. We understand that. But you notice what their, their idea was. They said, hey, we want to help one another. And, of course, it worked its way out and everything, and we have the idea of, you know, giving together into the church, and then the church sees someone has a need, and we give out to that. And we ought to do that. But he says, if you can't do that, how dwelleth the love of God in them? Verse 18, my little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Today we like to say talk is cheap. And so it is, right? Oh, I'll do this and I'll do that. But when the time comes, do you really do it? That's what we're to do. We can talk about the needs of the brethren of the world all day long, but until we do something about it, it has us, it costs us nothing. Remember what David said this morning? I actually had these in my notes before I, I made this, uh, the sermon from this morning, but 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. You see, it goes to God too. It's not just about our brothers and sisters in Christ. See, we can flip this penny back and forth. <laughs> you know, we can say, oh, I, I love my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, but then when they have a need, I don't reach out to them. Well, it's the same thing. Oh, I love the Lord. But when the Lord says, I need you to do this, do we step up and do what we said we're going to do? That's the evidence of it. You see, God looks on the inside. He knows whether we really mean it or not, but man can't do that. The only way I can know whether you really mean it, that you love somebody or not, is by your action. And, and whether you love the Lord or not is by your actions and what we do. And so he says, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, <coughs> excuse me, and in truth. Somebody said, now you've got to listen carefully to get this, all right? But it's good. Somebody said, your walk talks. And your talk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. You got that? Your walk talks. What you, what you do, people see that. And your talk talks. They hear what you say. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. <laughs> There's a lot of people saying a lot of things, but their actions prove they don't really mean it. And by the way, most of the people who truly love the Lord and are really doing something for the Lord don't say anything about it. <laughs> they don't walk around saying, oh, I'll do this for the Lord. I'll do that for the Lord. They just do it. Because they're not doing it for other people to find out and to see what they're doing. That's, that's the kind of person that won't continue to serve the Lord very long. But the people that truly say, hey, you know what? The Lord has done this for me, and I love. I want to do something for him. Uh, what can I do? And the Lord puts on his heart, hey, reach out to this brother over here. Give to this missionary. Do this or that. And they just say, hey, I just want to do it. I don't, nobody needs to know about it. The Lord always knows about it. And so you just do what you ought to do. And the Lord knows. He sees that. If we truly love the brethren, we will display that love in what we do, not just in what we say. And by the way, notice he says that we should love in truth as well. Do you see that? He says at the end of verse 18, but in deed and in truth. Now you can say you love the brethren all day, but what proves the truth of your words is your actions. That truth, that goes a little bit deeper. You see, there are some that are just doing things just to be seen, and there's no real love there. But the Lord knows the truth. So deed and in truth. And then in verse 19 he says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now the next three verses deal with the assurance of our salvation. John has been telling us that one way we know that we're the children of God is the love that we have. And then that we show to the brethren. So you remember that this morning, some of the verses we talked about? How you can know you really are a child of God. 
is that you have love for the brethren and some of those things. Now he's going to deal with some assurance issues. In verse 19, John says that one of the results of loving the brethren and acting on that love is that we are assured that we are of the truth, that we are saved. Now we often say that only you and God know for sure if you're saved, and that's true. But the truth is sometimes we wonder ourselves because of some of the things that we do. But this is one evidence that we are. Notice what he says, we assure our hearts. See that verse 19? And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Has your heart ever brought some doubts up to your mind? (laughs) You know, we've talked about the fact that we are a triune being, body, soul, and spirit. And that soul has the intellect, emotion, and will. And sometimes that intellect and that emotion gets crossways with one another. (laughs) The mind says we ought to do this, but the heart says I don't want to do that. And the heart says I want to do this. The mind says no, don't do that. That's not very smart. (laughs) We need to have those things in alignment. And those things come together to affect the will to decide what to do. And the will then affects the body. That's the way it ought to be. The spirit controls the intellect, emotion, and will, which then controls the body. Of course, most folks that are unsaved, it's just the opposite. The body does everything first, and then that affects everything else, and the spirit is last. But if we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us, and it ought to control man's spirit to control the intellect, emotion, and will. And so the Holy Spirit of God, if we're studying the Word of God, and listen, here's the thing. So many people that have problems with the assurance of salvation. And I've run into a lot of them. A lot of times they're uh, young Christians that haven't been saved very long, and maybe they, they got saved maybe in a revival meeting or some kind of a, not that they didn't really get saved, but some kind of an emotional type situation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes because of that, they believe that the emotion is integral to their salvation. Listen, it doesn't matter if you feel anything or not. All that matters is the Word of God. If you've done what God said to do, God will do what He said He was going to do. There's no question about that. But sometimes if somebody gets saved in a very emotional environment, again, there's nothing wrong with that, but then down the road, the emotions are gone, they may begin to believe, well, am I really saved? Boy, I don't have that, you know, that that emotion that I had before. I'm not just running around like I was before with all this. I wonder if I am or not. But if we will take them and say, listen, your salvation, just as it's not based on any of your works, it's also not based on any emotion, you know, that you built up any emotion or or whatever. It's based on the authority of the word of God. Here's what the Bible says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, we need to have some, when we witness to someone, we need to take the time to explain to them what that means. Sometimes we want to take a verse out of context. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, okay, Jesus, I'm saved. I called on the name of the Lord. No, if you take the word of God in context, you study what the Bible says about salvation, then we know what that means. You're calling on him for salvation. And, you're, and why are you calling on salvation? Because you need to be saved. Why do you need to be saved? Because you're going to hell. Why am I going to hell? Because I'm a sinner. So we understand these things. And if we build it upon the word of God, see, here's what the Bible says. Is that true of you? Are you a sinner? Yeah, I'm a sinner. Okay, it says the wage of sin is death. You understand you deserve hell because you, yeah, I understand that. Okay, but Jesus paid your sins on the cross. Do you understand? Yeah, you believe that? Yeah, I believe that's true. Okay, then you ask forgiveness of your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ? Yes, I do. Okay, if someone has done that, then you take them back to the word of God. It doesn't matter if you felt happy or sad or whatever, if that emotion comes and goes. If you've done what the Bible says, then God's word is true and he will be faithful. He has saved you. You are saved. And so you can, you can deal with a lot of assurance problems by taking people back to the word of God. Back to the word of God over and over. And like I said, a lot of times our heart, our emotion will tell our mind, well, hey, we're not as excited as we were the other night. Are are we really saved? But then the mind needs to tell the heart, hey, it ain't about emotion. It's about God's word. And so what, what does he say here? Verse 19, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So we take the word of God and we study. Now, this is what the Bible says to do to be saved. That's what I did. And he's given us some things to look at. Hey, if these things are true in my life, that's evidence that I'm saved. Do I love the word of God? Do I love the house of God and the people of God? Uh, Am I growing? Am I trying to be more like Christ each day? Do I truly have love? (coughs) 
<coughs> excuse me, if you take, see context is always important, and hereby, that word hereby, he means because of what we just read. So what did we just read at the end of verse 18? My little children, let us not love in word or deed, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So love in deed and truth. Love your brothers and sisters. And hereby, by the fact that you love your brothers and sisters in deed and in truth, that's an evidence of your salvation, and it will assure your heart. You can tell your emotion, hey, calm down. I've done what God said. There is evidence of Christian life, spiritual life. There's evidence of growth in me, and so I, I know that I'm saved. That's a powerful thing. And that's something that, uh, and again, it's not just young Christians. Folks have been saved a long time, sometimes deal with assurance issues as well. We go back to the Word of God. It assures our heart. Now, this is a wonderful verse, verse 24. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Oh, listen to that. Listen to how powerful that verse is. How many people, their heart condemns them, Right? Their heart condemns them. They say, oh, I don't have the emotion anymore. I don't feel saved anymore. So your heart is condemning you, but God is greater than our heart. Do you realize that God doesn't sit up in heaven and hear you say, well, I don't feel saved today, and go, oh, man, I wonder if he's not saved today. <laughs> you know, that doesn't affect him one way or another as far as your salvation. If you're saved, you're saved whether you feel like it or not. <laughs> Now, if you're not saved, and let me tell you this, if you're truly worried about whether you're saved or not, and you're not saved, I can guarantee you, if you're searching, the Holy Spirit of God will convict you of your sin and show you, hey, you need to get that right. And you follow up on that. But if you're saying, you know, I just, I just don't know the thing, things that are happening in my life and all these things, oh, my heart is condemning me. Oh, but God is greater than our heart. That's good. When I doubt, I don't have to worry about it. You know, they used to hear the phrase, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. But we know the truth is, if God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. And that's true of everything in the Word of God. You know, creation is true. And one day, a whole lot of scientists are going to find out that it's true. I pray that it's not too late, but it's true. And they can come up, oh, we have, you know, 99% of all scientists believe in evolution. That's not the truth, by the way. If you begin to study, there's a whole lot of scientists out there. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say that every true scientist looks at this world, and though they won't admit it to anybody, within their heart they say, evolution is really kind of stupid. <laughs> we don't believe this anywhere else, that order comes from disorder. But, of course, they have to push that line. They have to, you know, there's money involved and all that kind of thing. But there are plenty of scientists that will tell you, no, that, that's just crazy. It's obvious that there's a creator, you know. But there's a lot of them that, you know, well, we just don't believe it. And you get told, oh, there's so many people don't believe it. It doesn't matter how many believe it or don't believe it. Truth is truth, regardless. And the fact is, if you're saved, you're saved. And God knows you're saved. So whether you feel like it or not doesn't change that at all. So that's wonderful that God is greater than our heart. But why is he greater? Look at the end of verse 20. And knoweth all things. Knoweth all things. He doesn't look at you and say, I, I think he got saved. Didn't he get, I'm not sure. <laughs> Boy, he's having a bad day. He's kind of depressed today. Maybe he didn't get saved. No, he knows whether you're saved or not. No doubt about it. He says for, verse 24, If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Verse number 21 says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Now, if you're saved, you're saved, whether your heart condemns you or not. But he says, boy, isn't it great when you know in your heart that you're saved and you have confidence toward God. And you see, that, that's why it's important that the intellect, which ought to be controlled by the Spirit, which is controlled by the Word of God, be over our emotions. Too many people allow the emotions to get over the intellect. I don't feel this way, and so I guess I'm not that way. But the mind says, no, you are this way, whether you feel like it or not. And if we take the word of God, say this is what the Bible says, I know I've done that, so I know, just as God knows all things, I know that I'm saved, no doubt about it, that I tell my heart, hey, I don't care what you say, I've got confidence toward God, not because I, I did everything right, not because I'm smart or I'm good or any of that, but because God's word said, you do this, I'll save you. And oh, isn't that wonderful to have confidence toward God? 
The best situation to be in is to have that confidence. And that comes from studying God's word, knowing our salvation is not dependent upon us, but on the finished work of Christ. And when we add to our knowledge of our salvation by doing what we know we ought to do and what we naturally want to do, which is to love and serve our brethren, it increases our confidence. And when our heart is not condemning us, we are able to be victorious in all that God wants us to do. And you remember this morning, what John was talking about if you're, uh, if you're in him. Let's see, let, let's look at verse number 10. He says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Uh, for, this is, uh, for this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And he says, uh, verse number 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his sin rem seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And we said that's talking about the two natures that we have. You're born with one nature, a sinful nature. But when you're born again, you get a second nature. And so you have that sinful nature that's saying, hey, let's go do this. And the spirit saying, no, let's go do this. And you have the decision. Which one am I going to abide in? Am I going to walk in the flesh or in the spirit? What am I going to do? And as we walk in the spirit, then we naturally do the things the spirit calls us, us and leads us to do. And as we do that, it adds to our assurance of salvation. Because the outcome of those things is the evidence that John talks about. And so it just works together. It continues to build on one another. Verse 22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So because we have confidence towards God, we're able to come before him and ask of him what we will. But notice the caveat. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So there are two things to note in this. One, if we are doing what we should, we will want what we should. Get that? If you're doing what you should, you will want what you should. Too many people get saved thinking that God's like a little bellhop. You just ring a bell, he comes running and does whatever you want. No, when we get saved, we have that new nature. Now we have the decision, am I going to do right or wrong? And if we do what's right, the more we do that, the more we will want to do what's right. And the more we will want what we ought to want from him. So when we ask him for what we want, it's the same thing he wants for us. You don't get saved and then go to God with your list of things. Okay, now I want this and I want this and I want this. No, you go to him and these are the things that you want because you're living as you should. Then he's happy to give us those things. We think of prayer as the other way around. We come to God and ask for what we want and get mad if he doesn't give it to us. But we ought to first ask God to help us want what we should want. And when we are obedient to him, we will want what he wants us to want. <laughs> what will be pleasing to him. And then he's glad to give us what we want. Th think, of, uh, think of your prayer life like that. Instead of going to, going to God with your list and saying, all right, here's all the things I want. Here's everything I need. Instead of that, take the prayer list over, turn it over on the blank side, Say, all right, Lord, what should I want? What do you want from me? And Lord, as I read your word, as your Holy Spirit moves on me, this situation comes up. I think I know what would be best, but Lord, you show me what's best. You show me. I can guarantee you that God will say yes to every prayer you pray if you pray in his will. <laughs> if you get in there and you say, Lord, show me what you want for me, put that on your list and then say, Lord, now this is what I want. He'll say yes to those prayers. But we do it just the opposite. Secondly, we're, we're not to just sit around and just pray for everything. We're to do what we're supposed to do. In other words, do we, we're, we're to do what we can and then ask God to do what we cannot. You remember God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? He's there in the burning bush and Moses is there with his staff. He says, what's that in your hand? Oh, it's a staff. Cast it down. It becomes a serpent. And pick it back up. It becomes a... And he used what he had there. Elijah asked the widow woman to take and make him a little cake first. Take what you've got, do what you can do, and then see what God does. Hey, Jesus, when he comes to the tomb of Lazarus, you remember the first thing he did? He told someone to roll the stone away. Could Jesus have rolled that stone away? Of course he could. He could have snapped his fingers and demolished it. But he said, hey, y'all can do this. You go and do what you can do. I'll do what you can't do. 
roll the stone. And by the way, after they rolled the stone away, and then he said, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes out here like this, what did he do? He said, now loose him and let him go. Hey, he could have untwirled those too, but he said, hey, here's something else y'all can do. Isn't it amazing that God wants us to do what we can do? He gives us talents and abilities and opportunities, things that we can do. He says, hey, use what I've given you. And when you get to the end of what you can do, I'll come in and do what you can't do. <laughs> Work together. He expects that. He, he says that we're to keep his commandments. And in the next verse, he talks about one of those commandments. Look at verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us a commandment. So this is the ultimate summation of the Christian life. We enter into it by believing on the name of Jesus. The Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the eternal God. And get this, Jesus is the last and greatest name whereby he has declared himself to man. You go back and begin studying God in the beginning and see all the names that he gives for himself. All right, there, there's a lot of combination um, names that God uses a lot of different ways that they recognize him by but the last and greatest name that he shows himself to us is Jesus and that's what it says in verse 23 and this is a commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ that's how we enter into faith and we continue in faith your, your faith never grows beyond Jesus you know that some people think, oh, that's for little kids. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I've been saved a long time. I'm moving on from just learning about Jesus. I need the deep. No, you don't get any deeper than Jesus. That little phrase, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, you just start studying about what the Bible tells us about how Jesus loves you. That'll be enough study for the rest of your life. <laughs> And so we believe on his name and we continue to believe on his name. And then he says, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So these are the two things that we are to do. We're to believe on his name and to love one another. It is in the name of Jesus that we have salvation and then we prove that by the love that we show one to another. And then verse number 24, he says, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. And that's almost a Pauline verse there. <laughs> you know, Paul, some of Paul's verses, they kind of take twists and turns and, and uh, they, they give uh, English teachers fit sometimes, you know, because they're like, whoa, wait, where'd you go? And John's almost Pauline here. But notice again what he said. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. So here's number one. We, how do we know that we are dwelling in him? We're walking in the spirit, doing what we ought to do. Are you keeping his commandments? You see, the evidence of true spiritual growth and maturity is what we do on the outside. That's the evidence of it. A lot of people want to act like, oh, I'm so spiritual, but their life doesn't back that up. They say all the right words, and a lot of times they're very legalistic, looking down their nose at other people, but you begin to study their life, and they're not doing what the Lord said, especially when it comes to loving the brethren. Matter of fact, most of the people who think they're the most holy usually are the least loving of their brothers and sisters in Christ, have the least mercy and grace for them. But that's an outside evidence of what's going on in the inside. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. And then here's the next part, and he in him. <laughs> of course, that, that second he there is talking about Christ, dwells in us. It's evidence that he dwells in us. If we keep his commandments, it's evidence uh, that we are in him, and it's evidence that he is in us. This is just a, a tiny, tiny little, little piece of us trying to understand the, the Trinity, the three in one. We, we don't understand that. Our minds can't get that. And there's another evidence of that. It's called the hypostatic union. It's the fact that Jesus is God and man. We, we can't understand that. That's something that's beyond our comprehension. And theologians have tried for generations to come up with a way to explain it. And, and that's good. We ought to continue to study the Word of God, try our best. But I don't believe till we get to heaven we're going to be able to. And I think even then we're going to get say, I don't know. It's, it's beyond my, even my imagination now. 
But we have a little bit of understanding of it when we see that we are in him and he is in us. <laughs> How can that be? How can someone you are in them be in you? <laughs> well, that's the evidence. And then he says, and hereby we know that he abideth in us. How do we know that? How do we know that he abides in us? By the spirit which he hath given us. By the spirit. Romans 8 verse 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Boy, isn't that an interesting verse there? We, we talked about, again, the, how man is uh, three parts. We talked about that spirit. It, it is, it, is there literally a, a separate part of man known as his spirit? Well, we take the word of God at face value, exactly what he says. The spirit itself, that's the Holy Spirit, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has a conversation with man's spirit. And he says, you're one of mine. You're mine. Have you experienced that? How many times have you been down, you're having trouble, you don't know what to do, trying to make a decision, whatever it is, and you go to the Word of God. And you say, Lord, I don't even know what to do, where to read or what to do. I'm just going to start reading the Word of God. And, and we read, and he prompts us to stop and pray for a while, and then to read for a while and meditate on some things. And before long, the Holy Spirit is whispering to our spirit, you're mine. You're one of mine. We're together. And you begin to see things. You could lay it out in front of your unsaved friend and they could read it all day long and not get anything out of it. But a child of God reads that and says, oh boy, that's what I needed today. His spirit beareth witness. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. By the way, in your Bibles, is the word spirit capitalized? Should be. That's a proper name. That's not just the Spirit of God, some amorphous idea of God's Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit, three in one. He has a great ministry for us. And so as we conclude this chapter here, we see that John is talking about love. And boy, love is important, is it not? Look how powerful. He talks about it over and over, the love that God has given to us in showing us that in his son dying for us, the love we ought to show to one another. And as we exercise that love and as we are obedient to what we, we want to do, what he calls us to do because we love him, it assures us. And then the Holy Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit. Boy, that's powerful. Amen. And it's all because of the love of God. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you that we who are saved have the spirit of God dwelling in us. Lord, it's not something we can explain to an unsaved person how we know that we are saved. But Lord, we who are saved, we know that because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And Lord, that's such a precious gift. But Lord, there's probably some Christians, probably a lot of Christians that haven't heard from the Spirit in a long time because they've not gone to the Word of God. They've not gone in prayer. They've not truly sought after you and what you'd have us to do. Lord, we ought to miss that. We ought to want to have that again so that we can dwell in you and know that we're doing what you'd have us to do. I pray your Holy Spirit would help each one of us tonight to see an area where we need to come back to you and hear from the Holy Spirit of God through your word. And Lord, exercise the love of God as we should in Jesus' name. You can remain seated as we have a verse of invitation. Maybe you just want to pray and say, Father, help me to see this, these areas I need to grow and exercise the love of God.